with the word. Let's go to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, verse number 8. It says, Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Verse number 9. For in Him, that is in Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Verse number 10. And you are complete in Him, who is the head of all principality and power. In him also, you were circumcised with circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision, by the circumcision of Christ. So here, he's telling us that we are putting off the body of the flesh and the important aspect here is that the word used when it says putting off you see it doesn't say killing the body of the sins of the flesh the reality is that God cannot kill the flesh because otherwise we will die. Amen? So he cannot kill our flesh. But when we come before the Lord, we baptize our, in the name of Jesus. We are baptized in the name of Jesus. We're putting off the body of sins of the flesh. That means we're laying aside. Amen? We're laying aside. And we are being circumcised in the heart which is the circumcision of Christ. It means that we're cutting off something from our lives. We're cutting it off. And we're cutting it off by the power of Christ. Verse number 12, speaking of the circumcision of Christ, says, buried with him in baptism. That is the circumcision of Christ. In which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised them from the dead who raised them from the dead so we're buried with him in baptism and we were also raised with him through faith we're raised with God through faith in the working of God who raised them from the dead so what it's saying is that we are raised by the same power that raised Jesus from the dead and that is the power of the Spirit of God so we are raised by the Spirit of God. Amen? We are buried by the circumcision of the flesh or the baptism covenant in the name of Jesus. We are buried. Our sins are buried. We're laying off our sinful flesh. We're putting it off to the side and we're entering into covenant with Christ. You see, He takes care of our debt as sinners it's no longer against us but we still carry a sinful nature so what do we do when we commit to Christ and we enter a covenant with him we're entering a covenant that we're saying we're laying aside the flesh amen that is dying in Christ that is the that is the that, that is why we're buried with him in baptism in the water why because we are going to die to the sinful natures of this world we're gonna lay it aside amen and then God will raise us up through the power of his spirit amen he raises up in the spirit in the spirit we are empowered with his spirit we are lifted from our circumstances we're lifted above our enemies by his spirit Let's go ahead and uh, 
Let's pray together today and as we go into this word today. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your greatness, for your grace among us, upon us. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We lift you up today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So yesterday, in our Sunday School Revival, we were talking about, or I would say our theme was up, which means elevated. <clears throat> be raised up, to be lifted. And today I want to continue in that. I want to talk about how God is elevating us. So I want to title this Elevated. That's what God does to us. He raises up. He elevates us. Amen? He elevates us from any circumstance, from any sin, from any past. God has the power to raise us up. Amen? He has the power... To lift us up from the snare of the fowler. You see, Psalms 91 talks about that. And you understand, this is, I remember when I first came to the Lord, I mean, this was my favorite psalm to read. It was probably the first scripture that I memorized. It was the whole Psalm 91. And... I like to, we can turn to that Psalms 91 verse 1. It says, he who dwells in the secret place. Psalms 91 verse number 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. Surely he shall deliver you. Amen. From the snare. Say snare. Oh, hallelujah. You know what a snare is? Snare is also what we would, I don't know if we still use that today. People that hunt, they put snares out. I know we don't have that many hunters in South Florida. But there's things to hunt. You can go coon hunting. Snake, gator. We like the gator boys. Um, but what, what, we, what people use is called a snare, which is a trap. And the Hebrew word pach, pach, it means to, to put a net, spread it out, to spread out a net. <coughs> and this is what the enemy does to us. He spreads out a net. And he knows how to do it. Amen. He is a good hunter. The devil is a hunter. He's a scavenger. That's why the scripture says that your adversary, the devil, seeks, is seeking whom he's going to destroy. He is seeking constantly. Who can he destroy? Who can he put into a trap? Amen? Who can he put into a snare? That's what the devil is constantly trying to do. Trying to find a way to trap people, humanity. Before I came to the Lord, I was in a trap. I was in a snare. Amen? There is a difference between living 
away from God, without a consciousness for God, without the knowledge of God in your life, and living in a snare, in a trap. Because there's a lot of people out there, their lives may be functioning okay, they may not be in any type of um, important sin, they may be families married with children, they just don't care about God that much. They will fall under the category that they are blind. The scripture says that the devil, the God of this world, has blinded the minds, the, the eyes and the minds of them that they should not see the glorious light of the gospel. So what is the problem with those people? They're just blind. People are blinded. Okay? <coughs> but there is a moment... When uh, Before I came to the Lord, I was blind. In high school, I was blind. I could not see. But there was a point in my life when I fell into the snare. So you could be blind and not be in a snare. For example, a specific snare. But there are areas that the devil will bring to, bring, to put snares to people's lives. And he knows how to do it. He knows how to snare us. Amen. And sometimes the snares look terrible. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes a snare can look like a great job promotion. <clears throat> Where I have no more time for my family. Or I have no more time for God. Amen. That's a type of snare. Other types of snare can be alcoholism. Drug addiction. Th to drugs that destroy your life. Um, covetousness there are traps that the enemy will put in our lives and there are nets that he spreads out the net for you to fall for you to be snared and there's a there's a story to 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 illustrate to you how deceitful is the devil how he works you see the snares are lies that's how he works. He is a liar. He is the father of all lies. And he works through lies. We saw it from the beginning. He told Eve, God had God said, don't eat from anything? No, that's a lie. God did not say that. Amen? So what is that? That it's a lie. That is his specialty to work with lies. Amen? And the lies are snares. He brings snares to our lives so that we fall prey. So that we fall into this net that he's spreading out. And to illustrate it, like I said, look, hear this story. There was a, there was a farmer <coughs> who was getting ready for his crop. And in the story, I forgot exactly what type of fruit it was. But it was some type of fruit, a round fruit. And he was harvesting it. And it was coming time for harvest. So he went because he knew that there were thieves. That they were going to come steal his fruit. So there was this tree... That had three delicious plum fruits ready for harvest. But it still had a few more days till the day that they were going to be taken out. You see, the harvest had to be done at the perfect time. So that you guarantee a, an incredible tasty fruit. So then, knowing his enemy, knowing the thieves that were going to come and spoil his field. He went to this delicious tree. And he put a sign and he said, one of these three fruits has poison. He put a sign. So he didn't say which one it was, but he knew. So then he went home happily, calm. And the next day he got up, he went. And his fruit was still in the tree. And he was happy. He said, this works. But then to realize how the enemy works, 
The next day, he went up for harvest time. He's excited. I was able to defeat my enemy, and I'm ready to go pick up my harvest. When he got there, there was two signs. And one of the signs was the sign he put, and then the other sign said, two of these fruits have poison. So the man thought that he had outsmarted his enemy. But when he thought he could outsmart his enemy, his enemy said, no, it's not one, but it's two fruits that are poison. And he didn't know which one they were either. So he lost his harvest in that tree. And that, that is in a perfect illustration of the snare. You see, we... We, don't, we can outsmart the devil in his snares. There is no way to outsmart him. He is smarter than us. Unfortunately, he is. He is smarter than all of us. He's been around for a little bit longer. And he, he, he has tricks. He's a liar. He's a con artist. That's why we don't negotiate with evil. We don't negotiate with the devil. We don't, we don't try to outsmart him. The only answer to it is God. And the answer is that he will raise us. He will lift us. He will deliver us. Amen? He will deliver us. You know, you know what this uh, word, um, deliver, is? It's... Uh, Natsal from the Hebrew. And what it means is that he is going to rescue. He's going to pluck, pluck us up. He's going to preserve us. He's going to save us. God will pluck you out of the snare. That's the only way we can escape the snares. Is that he will pluck us out from the snare of the fowler and from the deceiver. Amen. From the perilous pestilence. From the deadly pestilence how is he going to do that too verse number four he shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings shall you take refuge his truth say truth shall be your shield and buckler amen his truth you see the devil is a liar amen the devil is a liar but God brings his truth. The devil is a liar, but the Lord brings the truth that brings light to your life. Amen? That brings deliverance. That's exactly what, what truth does. Truth brings deliverance. Truth brings light to your life. So, we can understand. There is no way that we can, we can outsmart anything in this world. We have to be lifted up. By the hand of the Lord. The psalmist said, he has rescued me. He has lifted me up from the miry clay. Amen. That's exactly what he does. He grabs our hand and he lifts us up. Hallelujah. That's what God is constantly trying to do in our lives. So before we came to the Lord, some of us were in the miry clay. Some of us were in the snare, in the lies of the devil. But what does God do? God lifts us up. He plucks us out. He takes us up by the hand out of the miry clay. Amen. Out of the snare. And he brings us into his kingdom. But after we come to the Lord, the enemy will continue to bring snares into our lives. Because he is the deceiver. Let's read in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 1. It says, we're going to read 1 through 8. He sh Ephesians 2 1 it says and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins he made alive verse number two <coughs> in which you once walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. I want you to hear this. I want you to pay attention to this. 
The Bible says that God, He rescues us. He gives us life when we were dead. Out of our sins and trespasses. In which we once walked. Before we walked in trespasses and sins. And why were we doing it? Because we were walking according to the prince of the power of the air. We were walking according to the counsel of the devil. Amen. According to the spirit in the world that operates in the world. What type of spirit it is? It says right there, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. If somebody is not obedient to the gospel, the only, the only reason they're not obedient is because they're still under the influence of the spirit that works disobedience. And that is the spirit of the prince of the power of the air that is working disobedience on people. It works in us, disobedience. It works in the, in the people of the world that they do not turn to God. And it is a spirit of disobedience. Amen. It is a spirit of rebellion. Verse number 3. It says, Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath, just as the others, just as the other unbelievers. We were, we were completely entangled upon fleshly affairs, upon the things of the world. Verse number four, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Amen. But God, because he is so rich in mercy and in love. Verse number 5. It says, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Oh, hallelujah. Made us alive together with Christ. By grace are you saved. And verse number 6. It says, and raised us up together. And made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So verse number 5 says, when, <coughs> verse number 5 it says, even when we were dead in trespasses, that means when we were sinners. What is Paul saying? But you can see, you're going you're gonna to understand Paul's lingo here. Remember, Paul it's part of the generation of the Messiah. He was alive in the days, you know, in the days of. Paul and all those Christians, many of the Christians were alive in the times of the Messiah. But what, there's, what he is saying is, when we were dead in trespasses, that generation, they did not know Christ. They did not know anything about Christ. And Jesus was making them alive together with him. Why? By the cross. Jesus was going to the cross regardless of the sin of the world. Regardless of the way that everybody was conducting themselves against him, he still was going to the cross. Even when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen? You can understand that. That does not apply too much to us because we were not alive then. We came to life after he had already died at the cross. Amen? But that generation, when they were yet sinners... Christ died for them right there in the cross. Amen. Prophetically, we're born into sin. Before we will come to the knowledge of Christ, that Christ had already died for us. Amen. <coughs> Christ was looking ahead to us also and saying, I'm dying for you too. I'm putting my blood also for you, even though you will live in sin and not recognize me till I bring you. Christ died for us. Verse number 6 says, verse number 6 says, And raised us up together, that raised us up together, and made us to sit together in the heavenly places. That is talking about the conversion. It's talking about now when we come to Christ, when we come to the Lord, when we give ourselves to God, He will make us sit together with Him. <coughs> he will raise us up together. And made us to sit together in the heavenly places. 
by his spirit. Amen? By his spirit. You gotta understand the scripture says in Colossians we read that we are lifted, we are lifted by the faith, we are raised by the faith on the working of the power of God. That is the Spirit of God. What does the Spirit do? When we are filled with the Holy Ghost, the Spirit is raising us up. It's lifting us up above the snares of the fowler. He is giving us dominion above the traps, above the miry clay. Amen? He's lifting us up that now we can see. Before we were blinded. But now we can see. We see the enemy. We see the work of the enemy. Amen? We see things in the world. Now we recognize. We have discernment. We can recognize things that are from God and that are not from God. Why? Because he is raising us up. Amen? To sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You got to understand when Jesus was resurrected it says and glorified it says that he sat at the right hand of God that is at the power of God so just how he was seated in the throne seated on high at the right hand of God he is sitting us together with him amen even though we're not there yet still he has given us dominion and authority that he has he has given it to us we have access to the celestial through Christ Jesus. Amen? We have privileges right now on the earth. Spiritual privileges. Heavenly privileges. We have them. Why? Because we are raised up with him in the heavenlies. That's why we have the gifts of the spirit operating on the earth. We have healings. We have miracles. We have wonders. All these things are happening. Why? Because we are seated together in heavenly places. Amen? In Christ Jesus we are seated together with him I know we feel we're on earth and we are on earth I know we do not feel that heavenly sometimes amen sometimes we feel very carnal sometimes we feel fleshly sometimes we feel like we are sinners and yes unfortunately we are but because of the power of the Spirit of God in us we're still seated together with him in the heavenlies. Amen? <clears throat> That's why I am glad that salvation is not counted by feelings. Because otherwise we'll be lost. But we are seated together with Him. How? Through His Spirit. We are seated together in the heavenly places. We are raised together with Him. Amen? You see, He's the firstborn. And now we follow through. We follow Him. He is the first resurrection. We're going to follow through that first resurrection. Amen. We're already lifted up to those heavenly places. Amen. We have that privilege. We have that power. And we have that authority in Christ Jesus. Amen. He is sitting us in those incredible heavenly places so that we have revelation from him. We have understanding. That's why he gives us dreams. That's why he gives us words. He speaks to us. Amen. <clears throat> and now that we are seated together in the heavenly places, we got to understand that that's why our life also takes turns and changes. Why? Because we're walking in heavenly places. That doesn't mean we cannot be earthly. We are going to be earthly until the day we leave because we have a vessel. We are a, a vessel of clay. We're still a vessel of clay. But the Apostle Paul says it that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Amen? We have a treasure in earthen vessels. And you would think, but God, this is such a crazy combination we are an earthen vessel, but we have this power that you gave us in this earthen vessel. Amen? We're this fragile flesh. Amen? We have this fragile flesh. But at the same time, we have dunamis. We have power from on high. We have the glory from on high in the Spirit of Christ in us. That's why he says we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the power 
or that yeah that the power it is from God and not from us so we got to recognize we are earthen vessels yes but we have the glory we have the power from God that he has given us and so it is such a crazy combination to think about there they do not balance each other there's no balance there where these earthen people where this fleshly people Filled with the power of the Almighty God. Filled with the glory of the Almighty God. That is Christ in you, the hope of glory. But because of that, because we are earthen vessels, and we have the power of God in us, we have responsibility in this world. Amen? And that's why the Bible is full of responsibility. You're not going to walk like you used to walk. You're not going to talk like you used to talk. Amen? You got you to gotta turn your ways around. Amen? You got you to gotta see things from a different perspective. Why? Because you're seated in heavenly places. Hallelujah. Many things in our lives will change. One of the things that is most contrary to heaven, and I'll show you this. One of the things that is the most contrary to heaven is called lust. Lust. It's one of the things that Eve fell through. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. So lust is an incredible enemy in our lives. Amen? But unfortunately, the world operates by lust. By lust. Amen. Stop here for a moment. Feel the Holy Ghost. The world operates completely by lust. Everything. Even things are sold by lust. Cars are sold by lust. Sports are sold by lust. Amen. Amen. I thank God I like soccer and I don't like basketball. Hold on, let me clarify. Because when I watch a soccer game, all I see is the ball. And there's not a show of cheerleaders all over the field and doing all kinds of things. I'm not condemning people that, you know, whatever, it's between you and God. But at the same time, what I'm saying is sports or even commercialize that. Okay, hold on a second. We got to throw in the flesh right now. Lust. Everything is sold by lust. It's like sometimes you're going through the expressway and you see this billboard, a completely lustful billboard, and at the end you see a little bitty ring somewhere. And it's like, oh, okay, so you're selling the ring. <laughs> but, but it's like you, it's like this little tiny little thing in the, in the billboard. Why? It's just the way the world works. The word, the world works by lust, and through lust, everything is lust, lust, lust. That, and you know why? Because the flesh is so receptive to lust. It's the channel of the flesh is lust. So obviously, marketers know if we want to sell this product, we need to throw in some lust in order to make it more profitable. That's the way the world works. And, and one of the things, let me tell you something, one of the things that I've realized, and I just want to get into this uh, just briefly. I, I want to read something that, that it was impacting me a, a few weeks back. Because we're talking about being in, in heavenly places, amen? And one of the things that can hinder us is the lust of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life. All these things can really hinder our way of seeing things and you know what <clears throat> there's there's in my time as pastoring and seeing the, the, the work of the ministry I can tell you that there's a lot of times people have an issue because and I'm saying both male and female have an issue um, because oh I'm not ready to commit to Christ because I don't want to have to change my lifestyle. I don't want to change my life. Uh, uh, the church is, 
you know, it's for nuns. So when I'm wrinkled and 70 something, then I'll go to church and I'll, you know, give myself to the Lord. But the problem is that that's not the way it works. But, and that is a lie from the devil because the church is not for nuns. The church is for children. Amen. The Bible says you have to be like a child to come into the kingdom of heaven. But the devil has put that image to the world. Yeah, he has done that. He's put an image that this is the church is for grandmas, grandpas, and nuns. That's the image he has tried to put. And Jesus said it's for children. Amen. But a lot of times, let me tell you, be very honest. A lot of times people leave the church because one thing, let's say, oh, I don't, I, I, uh, let's say something as silly as I want to dress however I want to dress. And they leave the church because of that one silly thing. And let me tell you something. But when they go to the world, I have noticed that the thing was not about dressing how I want to dress. It was not about that. It was about I want to give myself to lust. Because it's not about I want to do this or one of that. It's a, a, I want to experience. I want to live in that lustful vein. Amen? Where it's not because I see them and it's not that, oh, you know, they're dressing how they, no, it's not about that. It's like they're, they want to show, they, they want to feel that burning of the lust of the flesh in the world. And they give themselves to that. And you know what? I would have said, you know what? Just come to the Lord. Let God deal with you. Don't worry about anything else. Let the Spirit of the Lord work in your heart. But the problem is, that is the problem. The Spirit of the Lord working in the heart. Because He wants to cut off lust from our hearts. Amen? And this is a powerful scripture. Let me go together with you to Luke 17 and verse number 1. I'm going completely a different vein this morning that I'm going to go later on. It says, and he said to the disciples, It is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. That word offenses, so that you understand, is it... Let me, let, me, let me give it to you in the Greek. You're going to get this word. As soon as I say the Greek, you're going to say, oh, wow. That word offenses is the word, the Greek word, escandalon. Escandalon. And it is translated as scandal. Scandal. Mm-hmm. And you know what's interesting, too? It also means a snare. Hallelujah. Snare. Snare. The figurative of scandalon is to be a snare, figuratively cause of displeasure or sin. It's not just a cause of displeasure, because when we read offenses, we would think it's just somebody that does you wrong and you feel bad. That's cause of displeasure. But the word is not just for cause of displeasure, but also cause to sin. So it's a scandal on. It's somebody that will cause you to be displeased by offending you, making you feel bad, or by causing you to sin. That's why the ESV says, he said to his disciples, temptations to sin are sure to come. Amen. Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. Next verse. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he, and he were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. And then again, it says that he should cause one of these little ones to sin, says the ESV. Amen? Because it's the offenses here is not just how we see I'm offended because you hurt me. No. It's actually the whole concept of making you to stumble. Either by sin 
or by displeasure. Amen? Either by telling you you have a big head or by causing you to fall down and sin. Amen? Those two things. Now, let me show you. Verse number 3 is the most revelatory here. Verse number 3 says, Take heed to yourselves. Oh, hallelujah. Let me, let me see if we get it. Look what it's saying. Take heed to yourselves. Did you get that? Let me read it on the ESV. Pay attention to yourselves. This statement, pay attention to yourselves, is connected to what he just said. Amen? And then he goes into saying another part. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. But that take, uh, pay attention to yourselves is an exclamation. Amen? It's an exclamation. It's actually ex making an exclamation. Saying, it's like a pause in his teaching. And saying, pay attention to yourselves. And you may say, but hold on. We have a Christianity that tells us, don't look to yourself, nothing. Don't pay attention to yourself. It's all Christ. It's all Jesus. Jesus died for us at the cross. We have no responsibilities. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, pay attention to yourselves. Why? Here it is. Because there's lust. And lust can cause a little one to sin. And to fall down. This is the most powerful scripture that lets us know that modesty is important. Modesty is all about taking heed to yourself. That's what it's all about. You know? Because I know we as humans, we say, oh, but it's not my fault that person this and that. If that person has a dirty mind, right? Remember? It's not my fault. Jesus says, yes, it's not your fault, but take heed to yourself. But pay attention to yourself. How you carry your life in this world that you do not make any of these little ones be offended, fall down, stumble into the miry clay of sin. Amen? So this is, I'm not talking of specifics of modesty right now. I'm talking about the concept of modesty is to cover up lest you are an offense or a stumbling block. Amen? Both guys and girls is to, is to not be a cause to lust. You see, in the world, we dress to conquer. Amen? I remember, that's how I dress. I, I dress to conquer. When I was a teenager, I, I, was, I was putting it on. It was not for me. It was a hook. Amen? I was spreading the net. And I, you know, I'll dress and I'll say, this is definitely going to catch something today. Yeah, that's us in the world. Come on, I'm the only sinner here. You know, you grab the, you grab, you know, the the best one. You know, you're like, hmm, this is that. Look at you, man. Oof. Something's gonna happen today. Amen. That's how that's how it was in the world. And I'm not a girl, but if I'm a guy and I have those feelings, I can imagine a girl. No, I'm saying I can imagine that. There is a, there is a desire to dress to conquer, to, to obtain, to, 
He, he may not be the same level of guys that guys, you know, we do have dirty minds, unfortunately, but women, they have that desire too. And, and, and what, what happens is that, what, where do we get that from? It's called lust. It's in us. It's all, all, all humanity has it. All of humanity has it. But when we come to the Lord, we have to be, realize that we are sitting in heavenly places. Amen? And that's why God tells us, just be careful. Pay attention to yourself in every area. Amen? I'm not telling you, going to hell. No, I'm saying, pay attention to yourself. Amen? And that's why understanding the concept of paying attention to yourself helps you understand that modesty is not for church. Amen? It is for all of humanity. Why? Because I, I just would understand to be paying attention to yourself in the house of the Lord and not paying attention to yourself anywhere else in the world. We're missing the point. We do not want to be a stumbling block in any area, in any way, to anybody. Why? Because I'm seated in heavenly places. Amen? And I want to walk according to where I'm seated. Hey, hallelujah. If I'm seated up there, I want to walk according to where I am seated. Amen? And I don't want to be that occasion to sin. I don't want to be that hook anymore. Amen. I don't want to engage. It's different to look presentable, to want to look beautiful. Wanna, if a woman wants to look beautiful, pretty, that's okay. If you want your husband to say, wow, and drop the jaw, that's awesome. Amen. Yeah, drop is just like, oh, Wow. Yeah, that's good, but always within the context of taking heed to yourself. Amen? That is, that is the way we walk. Now, it is important, and listen to me, it's important to want to be beautiful for each other or, you know, well-dressed, presentable, attractive to each other. It is important. Because we're not, we're still married, amen? We still have our, our, our earthly life here. But always putting in context where we're sitting. And always putting in context that we have to take heed to ourselves. Pay attention to ourselves. And this is in every area of our lives. It's not just... It's not just in the way we dress, in what we cover. It's, it's also in the way we talk, the way we communicate, the way we respond. Amen? The way we forgive. And this is where Jesus says to them also, pay attention to yourselves. It says, if your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must, what? Forgive him. You must forgive him. One of the meanings of forgiven is to remit. To remit. So I just want us to put that in perspective today. This scripture to me is so powerful. Luke 17, 1 to 3. That it, that it tells us, you know what? We do have a responsibility on this earth. Why? Because we are seated in the heavens. And because of that, we just want to we wanna make sure that we are a presentable people in the area of of modest we are presentable we will be presentable we will mind those things that can cause an offense those things that can spark the flesh we will mind them amen for 
for women mostly it's in your outward appearance just because the way we wire the guy guys are wired for guys it's mostly the way we address women the way we talk to women the way we respond to them we need to take heed to ourselves that we conduct ourselves in a manner that represents the king amen the king in a manner at work gentlemen you gotta be mindful to yourself amen remember when I was at work working in Fort Lauderdale in my office I had to be very mindful because I dealt with customers all the time I was not gonna go into meetings with a lady by myself uh, I was very mindful trying to be very mindful the way I spoke to them sometimes maybe I was a little more in the serious side just why because I just don't want to be an occasion to a stumbling block in any way amen and there is that taking heed to ourselves that it is important also in that area but then also it is important in the area of when somebody makes us fall somebody offends us offend us responsibility is to forgive them Amen? To forgive them. How many times they ask? Jesus said, seven times seven every day. You have to forgive them. Amen. Why? Because we are in the heavenlies. Amen? We are in the heavenlies. Why don't we stand together and let's come here to the front. Jesus, we thank 